Good morning. Uh, my name is Myung Hee Yoo. Uh, I'm a principal research scientist at KIST, Korea Institute of Science and Technology. Uh, I'm going to be a co uh, uh, chair with uh, Professor uh, Schwinger. Uh, we uh, briefly discuss how we're going to run the session. And uh, we're going to listen to all four uh, talks uh, first. And then uh, we're going to have Q&A uh, sessions. And the first session, uh, I'm going to um, preside. And then the second uh, discussion session will be led by uh, Professor Schwinger. The first speaker is Professor Londa Schwinger. Uh, everybody knows who she is. She's the founder of the gender innovation field. And today, she's going to uh, speak on the gender innovations in science, medicine, engineering, and environment, case studies, and policies. So gendered innovations is taking flight. It's really exciting to see what's going on. Uh, we've been at it for about uh, five years. The website has been up. New policies have been implemented in the European Union, Canada, and the United States. And we have impact in research universities. Simone Buttendijk, who is vice rector at Leiden University in the Netherlands, for example, is launching a report on gendered innovations for LERU, which is the League of European Research Intensive Universities. And I think, Simone, you're speaking about that tomorrow, right? And coming up in September, Stanford will be holding gendered innovation roundtables in Silicon Valley for industry leaders from Google, Facebook, and the like. We're very excited. Gendered Innovations was funded by the US National Science Foundation, the European Commission, and Stanford University. To create it, we brought together over 70 natural scientists, engineers, and gender experts in a unique cooperation uh, which drew talent from across the US, Europe, and Canada. And I'm delighted to say that we've now expanded to Asia and have an active collaboration with Hee Young Peck's group. Um, and this collaboration has been so successful but that we've in, in, uh, appointed Professor Peck as co-director of the project to help us with collaborations in Asia Pacific. So today I'd like to explore gendered innovations with you. The operative question is how can we harness the creative power of sex and gender analysis for innovation and discovery? Does gender add a valuable dimension to research? Does it take research in new directions? So first, a bit of background. What do we mean by the terms sex and gender? Sex refers to biological qualities, male, female, or intersex. Gender refers to cultural attitudes and behaviors and which are learned and are on a continuum from masculine to feminine. Governments and universities in the United States and Western Europe have taken three strategic approaches to gender equality over the past several decades. The first is fix the number of women, which focuses on increasing the numbers of women participating in science and engineering. The second is fix the institution, which promotes gender equality in careers through structural change in research organizations. And the third is fix the knowledge or gendered innovations, which stimulates excellence in science and technology by integrating sex and gender analysis into research. And it's this third strategic approach that is the newest and the most important for the future of science, engineering, and innovation. So in this plenary, plenary I'll give you an overview of gendered innovations. And this afternoon, in the parallel session two, I'll go deeper into some of the case studies and methods. Doing research wrong costs lives and money. 10 drugs were recently withdrawn from the US market because of life-threatening health effects, and eight of those posed greater threats for women. Not only did these drugs cost billions of dollars to develop, but when they fail, they cause human death and suffering. We can't afford to get the research wrong. 
Doing research right, however, can save lives and money, and I'm glad that we have a study that gives some data on this. An analysis of the U.S. Women's Health Initiative hormone therapy trial, which was a large government-funded trial done in the 1990s, found that for every dollar spent, $140 were returned. The study also saved lives. There were 76,000 fewer cases of cardiovascular disease, 126,000 fewer breast cancers, 145,000 more quality adjusted life years, and while most of the results were positive, there were more osteoporotic fractures. So it's crucially important to identify gender bias in science and technology, but analysis can't stop there. We need to turn it around. We need to get the research right from the very beginning. And we can do this by harnessing the creative power of gender analysis to discover new things. And that's what Gendered Innovations is all about. Now let's go to the website. And I guess I have an innovation here, and there's no computer for me to. So my, uh, one of my co-directors is running the computer back there. So here's the website. It's free and available for you to use. You can use it for your own research. You can use it in your teaching. You can use it in seminars with colleagues. All the material is available for you to use. And the website has now been translated into several languages. Could we click on translation, please? So you see that uh, we have a German translation. We have a Korean translation. So you can read all of this in Korean. We have a Swedish translation, and the newest one is a traditional Chinese translation by our colleagues in Taiwan. So thank you very much, everyone, for all of your help. We think there's a Spanish translation coming as well. The Gendered Innovations website presents methods. So we have developed, so through these international collaborations, we developed all of this material has been peer reviewed. So we boiled down the kinds of questions you would put to your research to look for gendered innovations into 12 different questions. And you can see that they go through the entire research process. It's not just one question you ask about what do men and women do, but you have to look at your research priorities and outcomes, at your basic theories that you're using, what kind of data are you collecting, um, and so we have presented these, these methods. We try to be very short and easy, you know, easy enough so that you have the questions to put to your research. Then we prepared case studies. And we've put these into buckets of science and health and medicine, engineering, and environment. These are specific examples that have already happened where we have found that gender analysis brought you something new. So you get better science and more creativity by looking at how sex and gender functions in your research. So yesterday, I, at a session, I spoke about stem cells. We have a case study on stem cells. Today, I'm going to talk about the genetics of sex determination. Our Korean colleagues developed case studies on colorectal cancer, dietary assessment methods, um, and this afternoon I'm going to talk also about climate change. But right now, I want to give you just two examples because we don't have a lot of time. My first example this morning comes from computer science, specifically natural language processing and focusing on machine translation. So I start with a little story. A couple of years ago, I was in Madrid and interviewed by some Spanish newspapers. Now, I read a number of languages, but Spanish is not one of them, so when I got home, I zoomed the newspaper article through Google Translate to see what they were saying about me. And I was shocked that in this translation, I was referred to repeatedly as he. Londa Schiebinger, he says he thought, and occasionally it wrote, Google Translate has a male default. How can such a cool company as Google make such a fundamental error? 
Google Translate defaults, can we go down to the uh, image? So, so the blue one, go down. There, this one. Google translates defaults to the masculine pronoun because he said is more commonly found on the web than she said. So the method in this case, if you're looking at methods, you would look at analyzing gender. That's what this particular one does. So what I want you to see, no, let's, um, sorry, just go back. I'd like to look at that chart. So what we see, and this is the, this is the cool part, um, and we know this, by, looking, by using Ngram, which is another Google product, and we find that the ratio of he said to she said has fallen dramatically from a peak of 4.1 in 1960 to 2.1 in 2000. This historical change parallels the women's movement and it parallels robust governmental funding in increasing the number of women in science. With one algorithm, Google has wiped out 40 years of cultural change. And they didn't mean to. It's completely unconscious gender bias. So the fix, a couple of years ago, the Gendered Innovations Project held a workshop and we invited people from Google and people from Stanford, natural language processing experts. They listened for about 20 minutes and they got it and they said, we can fix that. So, and then they tried to fix it for about a year. They, it's, it, it's, a, it's an opportunity for innovation because it's a problem that is not yet fixed. So go for it, right? So fixing is great, but constantly retrofitting for women is not the best road forward. I had to ask myself how it is that Google engineers, many of whom are educated at Stanford, made such a mistake. What are we at Stanford doing that is wrong? So I'm soon going to be working with our new Dean of Engineering to incorporate gender analysis into the engineering curriculum. At Stanford, we teach a lot about gender studies, but not in engineering where it needs to be. Also not in the medical school where it needs to be. So uh, this is an innovation that we need to look forward to. So we at Stanford want to provide the best graduates possible for the companies in Silicon Valley across the US and around the world. Now, I certainly don't have to pick on Google. Other companies have unconscious gender bias. And these unconscious assumptions mean that we are not getting the best products available. Apple, for instance, released its health app, app called Health Kit in 2014. And this is an app that tracks your biology. So it can tell you what your blood pressure is, what your pulse is, can tell you how many steps you've taken that day. It can tell you all sorts of things. But what didn't it track? Apple got up and said, it tracks everything. And then the internet, you know, people got busy to say, no, it doesn't track women's reproductive cycles. So this year, Apple has re-released Health Kit, and now, so they fixed the problem in June of this year. So again, some products can be fixed, but what if Apple, Google, Sony, and other companies started product development research by incorporating gender analysis? What innovative new technologies, software, and systems could be conceived? As I mentioned earlier, we're launching a series of tech roundtables at Stanford in September to learn more about how gender analytics can spark creativity and innovation in industry. And this afternoon, I'm going to report, in parallel session two, I'm going to report on some of the new uh, gendered innovations in machine learning and big data that's coming out of these roundtables. We don't have case studies on these yet, but it's going to be very interesting to learn about this from industry. Now, I come to my last example, since the time is short. Uh, we have 25 examples, but I want to go to health and medicine and look at osteoporosis research in men. And this case study um, is important because I want to highlight the method rethinking standards and reference models. We have a lot of standards and reference models that we take for granted, and I want to think about that. Osteoporosis has long been defined as a disease primarily of postmenopausal women 
an assumption that has shaped its screening, diagnosis, and treatment. Why is this a problem? Men account for a third of osteoporotic uh, hip fractures after the age of 75, and when they break their hips, they die more often, and we don't know why. It's a problem, in this case, men have been left out. It's a problem that we don't understand. Despite the relatively high number of men who suffer from osteoporosis, the basic diagnostics for the disease were developed using young white females aged 20 to 29. In other words, the basic uh, reference population was young white women. So it's no wonder that we have poor diagnosis for men. The gendered innovations came in 1997 when a reference population for young men was established for diagnosis of osteoporosis in men. So here we are using this method, rethinking standards and reference models. Almost most, so most medicine and engineering takes men as the norm, but in osteoporosis diagnostic models, these were developed for women using women's bone mineral density um, and their, uh, their bone makeup. One thing that is important about osteoporosis, and now I'd like to go to our method, how sex and gender interact. And I want to look at this image created by Vera Regetsugrosik. Osteoporosis is interesting because it's a disease that is not only based in biology. It's not just a women's disease or a man's disease. It's not just based in genes and hormones, but it's based also in your social behavior. It has a gender component. And your bones respond to how much exercise you do, the kinds of foods you eat, and the kind of uh, uh, lifestyle that you have. So another method that we use in this case study is analyzing factors intersecting with sex and gender. And in this case, cultural differences are very important. Current studies are analyzing cohorts of men from China, the US, Denmark, and Sweden to understand how cultures shape bones. Different dietary practices and patterns of exercise impact bones differently, and the goal, of course, is to maintain healthy bones for diverse populations. Now, I'm going to uh, finish quickly this morning so that we will have time for discussion by going to our policy portal. Now, policy is an important driver of innovation, and I found that it was important to treat policy if we wanted to uh, push forward gendered innovations. Gender analysis is integrated uh, successfully into science and technology when four factors or groups come together to make new policy. That's granting agencies, uh, editors of peer-reviewed journals, uh, curricula, universities, and industry research. So, I'm, I'm not going, I'll go into this in more detail this afternoon, but I just want to mention that the glo if we go into um, granting agencies, what we've done on this page, if your country, if your granting agency wants to establish a policy where you ask for sex and gender analysis in the grant proposal in order to fund that proposal, you can go and see the great policies that are already working in some other countries. And I think the European Commission here is a leader in their Horizon 2020 program. They are asking that you take into account sex and gender when it is important to the project. And they specifically identified 137 subfields of science and engineering where they expect you to discuss sex and gender in your proposals in order to be funded. So you can see we have links there and you can see what their policy is. We also have the new NIH policies up um, and the Canadian policies and policies from the Gates Foundation. So granting agencies are important. Secondly, we have up the policies for peer-reviewed journals Peer review, editors of peer-reviewed journals can require sophisticated sex and gender analysis when selecting papers for publication. Papers are not excellent if they do not include sex analysis where it is required. Thirdly, industry, as I already mentioned, 
can incorporate the smartest aspects of gender into their products, and this will open new markets and enable more innovation. And finally, um, I don't have a portal for this, but we should put one up. University curriculum is very important. We need to train the next generation in how to think about sex and gender in their research. This is especially important in medical schools. I think that we may be causing some death and suffering if we are not teaching future doctors about the important sex differences in the body and also gender differences which can impact health. Innovation is what makes the world tick. Designing sex and gender analysis into research and innovation is one crucial component contributing to world-class science and technology. We cannot afford to ignore this opportunity. Thank you very much.